Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Ingham, and I went to Nepal, um, sponsored by Global Fairness Initiative, who've worked very closely with the Nepalese brick industry for quite a long time. So, um, Rich has already shown you a typical view of Kathmandu Valley, and there's a picture down there. My presentation is going to be talking about typical building construction in Nepal, and I've broken it into four categories of buildings stone, unreinforced masonry, clay brick, unreinforced masonry confined masonry and then uh, concrete frames masonry infill. And, and that is a progression in sort of the sophistication of the building construction. Now as you've heard, as, uh, as you drive towards the epicentral region and get out of Kathmandu Valley, these are the typical scenes that you see. With repeated shaking, most of the stone masonry has just completely collapsed. So these are quite simply stones uh, bonded together with mud. And so this is just routine images. You see that they've sort of essentially slid down the side of the hills. Um, <clears throat> and here again, you can see that even up to a month after shaking, people are still excavating and digging amongst the rubble. Uh, when I was there, helicopters were still flying, and I can assume they were um, still seeking out um, bodies being found in the rubble. <clears throat> this, I think, is a, a collapsed retaining wall, and you can see just the round boulders that were used there. Where there wasn't total collapse, the primary concern with stone masonry construction is delamination. And this is the same as seen all over the world. So we saw plenty of examples of this in, in Christchurch with stone masonry construction in Christchurch. Uh, the issue really here is how to build this form of construction back better. Because obviously in rural Nepal, there's just massive numbers of homeless people and these are the building materials they have at hand. And so how do we uh, encourage better construction of stone masonry? So again, just some shots of delamination. <clears throat> Moving up sort of the uh, sophistication scale one bit, we have what the locals call mud brick. <clears throat> and when I heard this the first time, I thought, oh, that sounds a bit weird. I mean, mud's a bit harsh, isn't it? Uh, but then you take a bit of a closer look at it and you realise that's actually exactly what it is. These are bricks, but they're bonded together with mud, not sort of the, the cement mortars or lime mortars we'd be using in New Zealand. And so here again you can just sort of see the quality of the, of the mortar they use. This was one of the more disturbing uh, scenes I saw when I was there. The family from this little building complex had to be dug out of the rubble here by their neighbours and um, we're quite simply rebuilding back their home with the same demolished rubble. And on the right of this picture, you can just make out a little pit. They were actually digging the mud right out of the ground, right beside the building to rebond this back. And so the fact that they were just lucky to be alive at all and quite comfortable with actually rebuilding back and doing the whole exercise over a second time, I really found quite disturbing. Um, but it emphasised that really they didn't have the financial resources to do anything more. A lot of these images were on television. I'd seen some of this sort of damage before I'd even left New Zealand. But we saw a lot of what we refer to as end wall separation and this failure mode and unreinforced masonry is widely reported around the world. We saw a lot of it in Christchurch. Uh, but <clears throat> it did seem that they had um, quite routinely very poor bonding and interconnect between the bricks. If you have a look at that top floor of that building, you can see that actually there's no bonding there and there's just a straight flush gap on both sides. Uh, we also saw a very common problem amongst New Zealand unreinforced masonry as well, is that if the diaphragms, the floors, aren't bonded to the walls, then the walls just sort of uh, fall out into the street. And here you can see that the locals have found um, logs essentially to prop the walls. <clears throat> this I think was really quite fascinating in that when you get inside these people's homes you can see what the floors are made out of. They're often made out of bamboo uh, or rough hewn logs and then for their flooring they use mud and they press the mud down and that's, that's their flooring system and you can see there the gaps as the walls move away from the floor and here again we can just look up and see above our head how the walls started moving out into the street. And here again, it's probably not particularly obvious, but when you were there it was, you can see that piece of timber, that's the floor from inside the building, and it would have originally been flush with the outside, and so the walls moved towards us by sort of about 50 millimetres or so. So there were massive numbers of buildings like this 
where um, people were worried about whether they could get out of their tents and back into their homes. And you really had to say, you know what, you're better off in your tent right now because these walls look right on the verge of collapse. And I certainly could not encourage you to go back into your house. Um, moving up the sophistication of the buildings, we see a lot of construction quite similar to New Zealand unreinforced masonry. Uh, so these buildings, as I say, are very similar to the sort of thing we saw in Christchurch and elsewhere in New Zealand. This was just down the road from where I was staying every evening. <coughs> And we also saw the same sort of failure modes we see all over the world and the same sort of failure modes we saw here in Christchurch. Um, and here's, this was um, a, a health uh, clinic and gable end wall failures and many of you will be familiar, we saw a lot of these sorts of failures in Christchurch. Uh, classic failures for long buildings with long diaphragms and how the middle of the walls just fall out. And here's just a good example of the sort of behaviour we would actually expect for in-plane loading of an unreinforced masonry building. So they do have classes of buildings that do similar to the sort of things we're focusing on in New Zealand and strengthening our own buildings. What I hadn't anticipated, not having done a lot of research before I went to Kathmandu, is that they actually have a number of really large unreinforced masonry buildings. So I've called these monumental buildings. But these sorts of buildings would be far bigger than you know, most of the buildings we have in New Zealand. So these are palaces, very large structures. This was one block away from where I was staying. Uh, you can see in the picture it's a high school, and that building would be about 150 metres long, so probably larger than any unreinforced masonry building I'm familiar with in New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> and I thought it was quite interesting to see that they'd actually done a very good job here of, of tying the roof into the walls, which no doubt saved a lot of that building. This is the Kaiser Library, and again, another large, um, sophisticated, unreinforced masonry building. And here you can see some damage to the parapet. So these buildings, just to re-emphasize, are the ones that uh, are most similar to New Zealand and where our engineering guidelines and other things we most sensibly applied to how we could strengthen them. Uh, but confined masonry is the building class that really dominates Kathmandu Valley. <clears throat> and you can sort of see a good shot of it right here. The idea with confined masonry is that it is a masonry structure. Uh, the function of the concrete is to contain the masonry and bind it in nice and tight. So the concrete frame itself isn't enough to hold the structure up and it's the masonry doing the work. Um, so just another example. And one thing we saw a lot of is that they do very good jobs with their plastering. And so um, a lot of sort of the warts and all appearance on the side walls completely hidden on the front wall. And you can see that these structures can be very large and by and large performed extremely well, at least for the level of shaking we saw. So the vast majority of these buildings um, were completely safe to reoccupy. There is, as you often see, um, <clears throat> sort of structures where you can sort of imagine this was originally conceived as a one or two story building and then they got creative and turned it to three, four, five, six and just kept on going. Um, so some of them look very uh, dubious. Um, and I've referred to already the plaster. So the thick plaster can be quite confusing, first of all, because it might hide damage to the concrete frame underneath. But more importantly, uh, it, it really can't accommodate any deformation at all. And under even small levels of shaking, you start getting this, this visible damage. And it's really just cosmetic. It's just a crack in the plaster. But then you've got all uh, the mums of, of Kathmandu worried about their kids and they're all sleeping out in tents and you're trying to tell them, listen, that's just a crack in the plaster. And that was one of the things my team at least was trying to do as much as possible is identify buildings that were safe to reoccupy and get people out of tents and into their homes. Um, so <clears throat> as you sort of notch it up from just a simple little crack, you saw quite a lot of spalled plaster. But by and large, I said that this again was cosmetic. It could be replastered, repainted, and you wouldn't really ever know. And sometimes that plaster was really quite significant in its thickness. Uh, you've already seen this sort of shot already as a schematic. This is a sloping site and there's a soil wedge behind this wall. And so this is where the soil wedge is punched out the infill frame. Uh, and we did see as we get close to the epicentral region, uh, a number of infilled walls that had failed outwards, out of plane failure. Um, and it's interesting that Obviously, this will happen after a sufficient level of shaking, but we didn't see this to anywhere near the same extent in Kathmandu. Here's just some other examples where you have the walls failing out of plane. 
But now back in Kathmandu, what you're looking at here is four buildings under construction that go back into the screen. And the first one on the street still is looking pretty okay. But what you're looking at there is, is that the, uh, the builders decided that they wanted to have a parking garage and extremely large windows on the ground floors. And this is fundamentally a building that's supposed to stay up because it's got lots of walls. And then they decided to leave all the walls out of the ground floor. Um, and so the building right behind it, this is building number two, it's had a soft story collapse while still under construction. And it's whacked into building number three behind it. And so you sort of got all these, uh, this domino effect. And so <clears throat> I think it has to be said that the quality of the concrete construction that I saw was not good. Um, a lot of the aggregates didn't look good. The reinforcement detailing didn't look particularly good either. But unfortunately, a lot of the time it was hidden up with extremely competent plaster over the top. Um, and this is slightly comical because you can see there's a whole lot of berry bags of cement there under this collapsed building. Um, so the cement's not where it needs to be, essentially. Uh, but, but here's just a different building in another shot to show you that we were seeing the sorts of thing that the engineers would point out. The bottom of that picture is showing you very small lap links. And if you have a look at um, that, that column in the front picture there, you can see there's essentially no cover to the reinforcement. So it's, it's all the classic deficiencies in reinforced concrete construction. Um, but unfortunately, as I said, visually from the exterior, these are very difficult to take because of very good plastering. Finally, as we move up to more modern buildings, this was an apartment block, so very um, high-end apartment block, about five years old. And when we went there, we met the, um, the groundskeeper, and uh, they were able to show us finite element modelling that had been done for the building, very sophisticated. And we inspected this building top to bottom and couldn't find a single crack in any of the concrete frames. So fundamentally, it's just as good as new. But you can see there all the cracking damage because they have as a culture this wish to put in all their brick infill. And so here's a brand new building, essentially completely damaged because of all this cosmetic damage to the bricks. And so here you can just see what it looks like inside with all these cracking, all the plaster, a loss of um, confidence in occupying the building and obviously great loss um, of value to the building owners. Same thing, this is a mall. I inspected several malls, so this is about 10 storeys high. Elevators were still working, so we were able to shoot up to the top. Did a full inspection of the entire structure and couldn't find a single crack in any of the concrete frames. But this is what it looks like from the outside. So the plaster and the brick has worked very hard and yet the concrete uh, frames themselves are undamaged. And so it's this idea that uh, in building back, they, uh, a great effort needs to be put into sort of trying to understand how you're not going to track the same level of cosmetic damage in the future uh, because it obviously has a very um, poor sort of effect on the community. You see this building and won't be in any great enthusiasm to go back into this mall anytime soon. Uh, also, there was sort of fake concrete uh, columns, so only because the plaster had fallen off you could see what looked like a concrete column was actually just a big whack of bricks. Uh, and here again, something you might have thought of as a concrete column was, was bricks. Shoring's come up already, um, and <clears throat> you can obviously appreciate that people who don't have any access to sort of technical literature are just trying their hardest. But most of the shoring we saw just felt that really it wasn't going to do what, what the people had hoped that it was going to do. A lot of these planks aren't actually um, pocketed onto anything at the ground level, so you sort of wonder why they don't just scooch across the ground. And quite often they sort of look like they're more or less just leaning up against the wall as well. Um, and uh, I was asked, as part of my team, we were asked to give some advice um, on the securing of Hanumanduku, which is the world number uh, the number one World Heritage Site in Nepal, um, and a very large complex. So the national royal thrones are behind that dark grey area in there, and they're sort of prized as some of the top artefacts of Nepal. That wall's 16 metres tall, and um, we had some information on best practice out of the US, and in particular out of Italy, and I had initially been led to believe that the army was going to assist, and I was asked to sort of come up with some advice. Um, but then, <clears throat> after nothing was happening for several days, came to understand that actually the caretaker was responsible for the whole job, and he was using these poles that you can see there on the far right of that picture, and that was the extent of the resources he had available to make this building safe. 
So as I said, that's a four-storey building and they're propping up with these little poles that are only a few metres high. Um, I had been advocating containers, but of course, we're, like, like we did in Christchurch so successfully, but you're so far from the ocean that um, the engineers said, well, we can't find any containers. But what I sort of then found a bit disturbing is we jump in the taxi and drive around town and, well, I saw plenty of containers. So I think with a, a, enough effort, perhaps that still would have been a viable solution. Um, but I think it's important to see these sorts of pictures because for anyone who spent a lot of time amongst the aftershocks, like most of you people in the room will be familiar with, um, this is really scary stuff. Walking down these narrow streets with, you know, four, five, six-story buildings right on top of you, um, it's, it's sort of like a, a, a tunnel of potential death if there was any shaking to occur. And many of these buildings are exhibiting, you know, massive amount of damage already as you walk between them. This is the sort of stuff we saw. Th these shots are only uh, five minutes' walk from where I was staying at my hotel. So I was actually walking down there in the evenings and mornings because I just found it so fascinating. But at the same time, where am I going to run or hide if, if the ground starts shaking? And so I think for me, this is the real challenge of, of Kathmandu is, is how to tackle this high density, very tall masonry construction. One of the things that they do is a gravity fed water tanks on the top of their buildings and they have these um, towers, you can see one there, but if you look in the distance you can see them perched on all the buildings all over the place. And those masses of those big water tanks at the very top of the building, they shake around like crazy, they attract a lot of damage. And here was a building still under construction and um, its tower completely jettisoned itself off the side of the building and skewered itself into the ground. And you climb up to the top and you can see these little, tiny little laps and obviously the whole thing had just thrown itself right off the building. We've discussed already the building conditions when you get out of the valley, just really, really steep. And um, anywhere there was a flat spot, there tended to be a road, so it was very difficult to actually put a building on a flat spot. So you've seen this building already, but in the hillsides, just a lot of building damage that seemed to be attributed to foundation conditions. Um, a lot of leaning buildings, and it is just a sort of shot that when you sort of track it all through, damage seems to be kicking in right at the foundation level. In the valley, we saw some settlement, so this was a fairly new building, and you can see here that under the shaking, it seems like the building's just sunk, and the soil pressure's just sort of popped up underneath the slab, um, so fairly large cracks. <clears throat> Placarding was interesting in that. Uh, a small number of, of government personnel are authorised to placard, but many, many teams were doing assessments without having the authority to do placarding. The two concerns were that placarding attracts liability, and secondly, that placarding would start triggering emergency funding to the owner of the building. And so um, my team alone, we were, we were part of a, a two-week cycle, um, probably did a, well, several thousand assessments, and I know Jatindra and others, we were up to sort of 50,000 assessments, all done without placing placards. Um, so what is done, here's the assessment team. We were teamed up with locals, and so part of uh, what we were doing was also training the local community on how to do effective assessments. But many of them had been actually doing quite a number of assessments before we even arrived, so we're quite up to speed. Um, <clears throat> they don't have street addresses in Kathmandu. They sort of ring you up until you got mail at the post office, you have to come and collect it. So the roads and the streets don't have names. So you have to get the GPS coordinates of every single building and you have to get the phone number of the tenant in the building. And so you have to collect all that information. But we were doing rapid assessments and detailed assessments. So the documentation wasn't much different from what we have here in New Zealand, except that the forms um, didn't seem to capture all the things that we were actually seeing in the field, so suggesting that they could certainly be improved a little. And finally, because it was never clear how um, information was going to sort of come back to the building owners formally, we were essentially doing consultation on the fly and, uh, and uh, the guy in the yellow hat there was uh, my colleague and so um, we'd consult with each other and then give advice back to the building owners on what we thought was the best way for them to proceed. <coughs> So what next? Well, I would expect that um, the assessment documentation could be improved. 
The rebuilding in the rural areas is a massive, massive task. You saw the damage that's happened there. Millions of people that need to have their homes rebuilt. And the hope is that just with a little bit of extra care and the use of things like telephone wire and other sort of resources they have at hand, perhaps they can build back and make their buildings a bit stronger. Um, we've seen um, rule of thumb type sort of uh, designs and it seems a little bit of foundation work would be useful along with the building details. Uh, I do think that there's a number of buildings that could be uh, remediated with the outer plane walls being pulled back in if they were tied back to the diaphragms. Uh, and then for the more sophisticated buildings, we were getting a lot of uh, questions from the engineers, but being able to uh, strip out the brick infills and replace them with infill that didn't attract the same amount of cosmetic damage. And finally, training. It does seem that they really are missing uh, the technical resources, whether it be the number of professors with expertise in this subject area or just the whole infrastructure around training, and so maybe that's somewhere we can make a contribution.